questions. Uh, okay, Thank, thanks everybody to joining us for CDTG. Today's speaker is Professor Brito. He's from Purdue University at, in US. And in this seminar, he will discuss the challenges and opportunities for incorporating animal welfare traits in livestock breeding programs. Some of the examples that he will discuss include heat stress in lactating sows, epigenomic effects in, in utero heat stress, temperament in beef and dairy cattle, and food allergy in pigs. Luis is originally from, from Brazil. He finished his uh, bachelor and master degree in genetics and breeding at Federal University of Viscosa. And after that, he did his PhD and postdoc at University of Guelph in Canada. And recently, just about a few days ago, we need to congratulate uh, Luis for becoming a uh, associate professor at Purdue University. So with this, uh, Luis, floor is yours. You can share the screen and start presenting. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. And Ivan, thanks so much for the invitation to come here and talk to you guys about the work that we are doing. And also thanks for the introduction. So today I'll be talking about improving livestock welfare through the integration of genomics and complementary data sources. <clears throat> so I think we are, most of us are aware of the impact that genetic selection has played on improving the productive efficiency in both in plant and livestock systems. So for example, if we look here in this graph, in green, we present the number of cows over time, while in gray, the mu their milk yield in kilograms per cow. And what we see is that there was a, a drastic uh, reduction in the number of animals, while the milk production per cow has more than doubled. In other words, we have increased productive efficiency. We are producing more milk with less cows. And this genetic progress has become even more um, uh, or even faster with the introduction of genomics in the past one or two decades. And in this plot, I present uh, some key traits in dairy cattle breeding uh, based on their standard deviation unit before and after um, the use of genomics for selecting breeding candidates. And what we see is that after the implementation of genomics, there was a major increase in, in genetic progress for these traits that have been under selection. And what is even more interesting is traits such as fertility, in which there was a decrease of those traits after the, we start to use or to incorporate genomics, we start to move on the right direction. And other traits that are measured late in the life of the animal, such as longevity, or that are difficult or expensive to measure, we have been able to make very good genetic progress for those traits. And if we look at the, our selection goals over the past century, we see that we were not being very detailed. So mainly for a very large number of years, we were mainly selecting for milk production or milk production traits and confirmation. And only more recently, we start to select for other important traits such as longevity, workability, which includes milking speed and milking temperament, health traits, and fertility. And what happened is, as we were selecting for those traits, of course, the ones that were included in the selection index, we were making uh, genetic progress for them, the production and confirmation traits. Other traits that were not directly included we were also making progress such as longevity. However, traits such as health and fertility, that was a decrease on those traits. In other words, we were improving productivity, but we were decreasing fertility. And as soon as we start selecting for those traits, this 
path changed and we start to make progress for all those traits that we were uh, selecting, which is uh, very exciting and indicates to us if we select, we can make progress on all those traits. And as we start to move in the direction of livestock sustainability, so the question that I have is, what is next? So we have shown that, especially in the case of dairy and other uh, livestock of interest, production efficiency is a key um, breeding goal. So what are the next steps? And in my view, livestock welfare is a very important one for several reasons. First, animal welfare has increasingly relevant uh, ethical, legal, and economic implications in livestock production. So we all see uh, in the media how animal product consumers and the public in general, they care about animal welfare. So we need to keep this in mind. And also we know that poor welfare is associated with animal lower animal productivity, higher mortality, lower longevity, poor meat quality, reduced reproductive performance, and greater prevalence of diseases. So there are several reasons for us to care about animal welfare. But before we go further, what exactly is animal welfare? So historically, it has been defined based on three intersecting themes or approaches, which includes biological functioning, natural behavior and affective states. And as we know, animals are sentient beings, which means that they experience both negative and positive emotions. And therefore, this new concept uh, of the five animal freedoms has been proposed. And it mainly comprises of the indicators of the absence of negative welfare, such as thirst, hunger, and malnutrition, physical and thermal discomfort, pain, injury, and disease, fear, and distress, as well as the presence of positive welfare, such as the freedom to engage in motivated behaviors. So as we can see, animal welfare is a quite complex um, concept, and it is a, a very recent um, scientific discipline. And wh what are the challenges? Why is it so difficult for us to eliminate the welfare issues in livestock production? So first, we know that climate change is a big issue, and this has a, even a greater impact in animals that are raised in outdoor production systems, where there is much less environmentally controlled conditions. Also, there has been a growing intensification of commercial production systems. Animals that are group housed, if they are in inadequate systems, there might be um, a great incidence of negative interactions, such as tail biting in the case of pigs, which will consequently affect the welfare of those animals. Also, certain there has been an increased antibiotic resistance indicating that certain antibiotic treatments will not continue as being very effective. And if they are not effective, the animals will suffer more. There has been quite, high, there is a very high disease prevalence in livestock production systems, especially tends to increase as there is a greater intensification in commercial production systems. Over time, as I showed before, genetic selection has been based on a limited number of production traits, which has also caused indirect genetic response in other important indicators of animal welfare. So considering all those challenges to eliminate animal welfare issues, as a geneticist, what can we do? So, one very important area is selection and breeding of more resilient animals as a complementary approach. This will not solve all the issues, but breeding more resilient animals will be an approach or one path for minimizing the welfare issues in commercial production systems. How can we do that? So how can we breed more resilient animals? So in my view, there are three main ways. So first we can learn from evolution, from our selection decisions, including our previous mistakes, 
and breed differentiation because this will guide our choice of genetic resources that will be more adapted to certain production systems and geographical regions. And therefore they will have less uh, welfare issues under those production systems. And also this will guide the conservation strategies of those genetic resources so that we can have more genetic variability in the future as new challenges appear. The second path is selection for indirect indicators of animal welfare. And an example would be genomic reaction norms for heat tolerance based on longitudinal traits, such as feed intake, animal activity, or milk yield variation. In this case, or using this uh, approach, we basically evaluate the genetic merit of the individuals under different environmental gradients, and how does that impact the phenotypic trait that we are measuring, such as milk yield variation. And the third pathway, which is a quite important one, is selection for direct indicators of animal welfare. And this can be done through using data from precision livestock farming sensors and physiological or behavioral biomarkers and et cetera, where we are selecting for direct indicators of animal welfare. And we cannot improve what we don't measure. So breeding requires assessment of animal welfare. And as I mentioned before, animal welfare is a quite complex concept and it requires the longitudinal measurement of multiple indicator. So we cannot just measure a single trait. So we need to measure multiple traits and we need to measure it on a longitudinal uh, perspective. And in this paper here, we present uh, our vision on how this might be done and what might be some alternatives for large scale phenotyping of livestock welfare in commercial production systems. And we are basically becoming animal paparazzi. So we are trying to collect as much data as we want on sound activity, production, and physiological indicators, behavioral indicators, and so on. So we basically want to track those animals throughout their whole lives and collect as much data on individual animals as we can. So that's where it comes, the research program that we are developing here at Purdue University. So we work on a wide range of methods, but with the main goal of improving animal welfare. So we work on evaluating, doing phenotypic studies, estimating genetic parameters to understand how heritable the traits are and how genetically correlated they are to traits that are already included in commercial breeding programs to understand the genomic uh, background of those traits through genome-wide association studies, systems biology in which we integrate different omics data sets, also genomic predictions so that we can use uh, the phenotypic and genomic data to select individuals as early as possible, and also how to incorporate all these traits in breeding programs. To do that, we are using data that comes from precision livestock farming, genomic and other omics derived data sets, data from commercial farms and private companies, public data sets, and also collaborative projects. So we have various ongoing projects related to genomics of animal welfare, including climatic adaptation in pigs and dairy cattle, temperament and docility in both beef cattle and dairy cattle, food allergy in pigs, welfare and behavioral response in precision livestock farming in dairy cattle, calf and, and heifer wellness, functional longevity in both beef and dairy cattle, social interactions mainly based on indirect genetic effects in pigs, hoof health in Australian and US Angus cattle, skeletal health and walking ability in turkeys, and modeling of overall animal resilience based on longitudinal traits. Due to time, I have chosen three of these projects to, to, make, to talk about today. So I'll be focusing on climatic adaptation, temperament and docility, and food allergy. 
So let's jump in our first example on, of climatic resilience in pigs with a main focus on lactating cells. And the reason for that is because during lactation, it is a time where cells are very sensitive to heat stress because their thermoneutral zone is different than the one from their piglets. And also they are producing more milk. And if they are producing more milk, they are generating more metabolic heat. So this is a very critical period for in the swine production system. And I, I believe I don't need to convince you that climate change, change is real. So here are just some of the headlines from last year. And we have seen so many predictions showing that how our actions now will, let's say, indicate or will tell us what will happen in the future. So if we do not act now, the scenario will be very dramatic in the future. And in addition to taking multiple actions for minimizing the impact of climate change, us as geneticists, we also need to work on breeding more climatic resilient animals. In order to do that, we need good indicator traits, traits that are heritable and ideally highly repeatable, traits that can be easily measured in a large number of animals. And of course, they need to capture the key biological mechanisms associated with the breeding goal of interest. We need to identify genes and metabolic process that are associated with heat stress response, both prenatal and postnatal. And we need to evaluate the performance of genomic prediction of breeding values. And that's very important because now genomic selection has become a routine in many, in most uh, livestock breeding programs. And in order to do that, we need to develop our training population, which consists of individuals that have both genomic information and also phenotypic information. And with the decreasing the cost of genotyping, generating the large amount of phenotypic data is becoming um, the key priority. After we develop these training populations, we then estimate the effect of thousands of genomic markers, which will um, be part of our prediction equations. And uh, after we have this accurate prediction equations and we have the genomic information on selection candidates, then we can apply these prediction equations and we can make decisions on these young individuals and we can select which ones are going to become the parents of the next generation. So now, as I said, the phenotypic data is very important. So the first question that we have is, can we use the phenotypic data that's already collected in nucleus and commercial herds for improving the traits of interest? In order to answer this question, so we did a project that was funded by the USDA together with a company called Smithfield Premium Genetics, where we had data from 33 farms in the United States and also in Mexico. And we had data for reproduction, including total number of piglets born, number of piglets born alive, and number of piglets weaned winning weight and off-test weight, and also ultrasound uh, carcass indicators such as ultrasound muscle depth and ultrasound back fat thickness. We had 9,000 genotyped animals from the large white breed. Then we define the statistical models should be used, and we calculate the effect of the contemporary group for the traits of interest as the environmental gradient. The reason for that is because the contemporary group, it would be much easier for practical implementation. And we uh, calculated single step genomic reaction norms, which basically we obtained the, the genomic breeding value for the, each individual across an environmental gradient, in which in this case is the effect of contemporary group. We estimate variance components, perform single step GWAS, and also functional analysis to understand this genotype by environment interaction. What we observed is the three out of the traits that were evaluated, the three with the largest uh, genotype by environment interaction were total number of piglets born, number of piglets born alive, 
and winning weight, we can see that all the three traits, they are heritable across the environmental gradient. And usually on the average environmental gradient, the heritability tend to be lower and they, in the extremes, they tend to be higher. And when we look at the re-ranking of the top and bottom individuals that had accurate genomic breeding values, we see that there is clear re-ranking of individuals. In other words, the ones that perform better in one uh, condition will not perform, will not be the best ones under another condition. So this indicates that there is clear genotype by environment interaction, and this needs to be taken into account when designing our breeding programs. We also evaluated the genomic background of these traits, and we saw we basically identified that for both the intercept and the slope, in which the slope is the indicator of the environmental sensitivity or of the G by E, we observed that those traits, they are highly polygenic. There were around 27 genomic regions that were identified in both autosomal and the X chromosome. Each one of those regions explain a small proportion of the total additive genetic variance, but they were, um, they harbor very important genes, including genes related to immune response, stress response, and so on. So indicating that those are important regions related to the genotype by environment interaction in maternal line pigs. So the next question that we have is, can we use this data that I already discussed, but also incorporate climatic variables from public weather stations? Because we have historical data that's usually stored in several national databases. So we could use this data for selecting for improved heat tolerance. So in order to do that, we use the similar traits that I mentioned before. We worked with a heat stress physiologist for defining what are some critical periods for averaging or for calculating the environmental gradients that we should be using. And we came up with uh, different critical periods depending on what were the traits of interest. And we also evaluate multiple environmental gradients, such as mean temperature, dew point, relative humidity, average discomfort index, average THI, which stands for temperature and humidity index, and so on. We compared all these different um, critical periods and environmental gradients based on three main parameters, which in which the first one was the additive genetic variance of the slope, the accuracy of the genomic breeding values, and the variability in the genomic uh, breeding values for each environmental gradient. And then we basically for each trait, we came up with the best measurement interval or, or the best critical, critical period, and what would be the environmental gradient recommended for evaluating heat tolerance based on each one of those routinely measured traits. We also observed that this, all these traits were heritable and the heritabilities are actually quite moderate for most of them. Similarly to what I had shown before, there is a clear re-ranking across environments and it is even stronger when we are using climatic variables instead of the effect of contemporary group. And we can see here that in black, we have the average of the population. And then we have in red, uh, the ones that are, uh, or the two extremes basically in red and blue. When we look at the genomic predictions of the slope, which indica indicates the heat tolerance uh, of those animals, we found that those accuracies, they are similar to other production traits that have a quite high uh, or large uh, training population. And we conclude that heat tolerance can be predicted with a moderate accuracy based on routinely recorded phenotypes and public weather station data. We also did the GWAS and we found again that it is a highly polygenic trait. So there are multiple regions, genomic regions influencing heat stress response. And there are genes in, uh, involved in immune response, 
feed conversion ratio, gestation length, stress response, including cortisol level, maternal infant side, which is quite interesting as we are evaluating total number of piglets born and number of piglets uh, weaned. So this was quite interesting. And as we have these two options, so our question is, which one is better? And when we compare the two, for the intercept, which basically indicates the production under the average conditions, there was a quite high correlation between the two approaches. However, the slope that indicates the GBI effect, it is not highly correlated. And therefore, if the goal is to improve heat tolerance, it is recommended to use the cl direct cl the climatic variables as the environmental gradient because the contemporary group effects, they will capture additional GBI sources. So I think this is an important conclusion of these two uh, studies. But how can we do better? What can we do better? So an option would be to collect within barn climatic conditions coupled with physiological and behavioral indicators of heat stress. So last summer, we chosen out of uh, many farms spread across the US, the one that would have the most challenging conditions over the summer, which is one located in North Carolina. And we measured a quite wide number of traits, including skin temperature in the ear, shoulder, rump, tail, also automatically measured vaginal temperature in which we use a quite simple to build sensor in which we can get vaginal temperature ever one minute, five minutes or 10 minutes as we want. In our case, we collected vaginal temperature ever 10 minutes. Respiration rate, we had body condition score, hair density score, panting score, hair cortisol. We developed a nitogram for capturing behavioral changes. We collected ear pictures to evaluate ear area and also vaginal swabs in a collaboration with Dr. Christian Moteca from North Carolina State University to also evaluate the microbiome of those cells. And of course, all of them were genotyped. And here I will have selected a group of traits to, to talk about due to time, but I'm happy to discuss further with you as well afterwards. One that we were very excited about is automatically measure vaginal temperature, because as we see, there is a very nice distribution. Throughout the whole period that we were doing the measurements, we can see that the average vaginal temperature was above the normal body temperature of lactating cells from 37 to 39 Celsius. And there were some cells that were extremely heat stressed. So this was very exciting for the research. And as we were collecting within uh, barn data, we wanted to know if there was any difference in the enclosed rooms or the naturally ventilated rooms. So does it make a difference if we are using the data from public weather stations in which one of this type of rooms or if we are using the within barn uh, data? And what we observed, so the F1 buildings are the ones that are enclosed rooms. So there is a greater environmental control and the buildings F2, F3 and F4 are the ones that are naturally ventilated. What we observed when we compared the two sources of climatic variables is that for temperature, we observed the high correlation between the public weather data and the within room in both building types. When we look at humidity, we observed a medium to high correlation in the naturally ventilated rooms. However, only a low correlation for the enclosed rooms, which is an important information that highlights or that tell us that we should be collecting within barn climatic variables for selecting for heat tolerance in pigs. When we look at the genetic parameters of these traits, First, I want to draw your attention on these uh, values in, in yellow, because this represents the genetic correlation among skin temperature measuring different locations. And what we observed is that there is a quite high genetic correlation among 
the, between the skin temperature measuring different body locations, indicating that we do not need to measure in all those locations for making genetic progress for that. When we look at the heritability for the skin temperature, we see that although they are heritable and significant, they are on the lower end, indicating that there is a higher environmental control uh, or environmental influence in this uh, trait. When we look at vaginal temperature, we were very excited because the heritability is 0.34, which is higher than many other production traits that we have made great genetic progress. And as you can see in red, the genetic correlation with skin temperature is only moderate. And this tells us that skin temperature is not the best indicator or the most efficient indicator of a heat stress response at the physiological level, right? Because we define heat stress based on the change in body temperature. So this tells us that vaginal temperature seems to be a better indicator. And out of curiosity, some of those other traits that we observed, which are actually quite simple to measure, such as hair density score, they're actually quite heritable. And we can predict them based on genomic information with quite good accuracy. So the conclusion of this result is that automatically recorded vaginal temperature seems to be the best indicator of heat stress response. In addition to that, we are also working on other indicators of climatic resilience. One of the others that we have uh, analyzed is basically the slope of the regression of vaginal temperature on the environmental gradient. And we compared different environmental gradients. And what we can see here on the column of heritability is that there is a difference in the heritability estimates depending on which environmental gradient we are using and also this will impact the accuracy of the genomic breeding values. And THI and temperature seems to be the best indicators while relative humidity for this specific case is the, the worst environmental gradient to be used for genomic predictions. When we look at the individuals that were genetically divergent, what we observe is during certain times of the day, there is almost no difference between the animals that are more heat tolerant or heat sensitive, especially during the night. So as we can see here, in blue, we have the heat tolerant group. In orange, the non-heat tolerant, the more heat sensitive. However, during the, mo the hottest times of the day, we see a clear difference in the two groups of animals. And the same is observed based on respiration rate. So this indicates that there is a very good opportunity for breeding for improving uh, heat tolerance. When we compare the difference in the genomic breeding values of the 5% top and bottom individuals, we see that there is a clear and no overlap between their genomic breeding values. So we are able to distinguish those two groups of animals at the genomic level. The next question that we have then is, are there time dependent genes influencing heat stress response? In other words, are there genes that are more important early in the day or later in the day? And so Hui is a PhD student working in our group and she did, she's doing this research in which we have compared multiple models and I'm only presenting the best one here in which we used random regression models and B spline to model the vaginal temperature all throughout the day. We consider both heterogeneous and homogeneous residual variants. And what we see is that it is heritable. So we have an average of around 0 0.4 or 0 0.45 throughout the day. And there are times of the day in which the heritability is higher. And this is a very important uh, information, especially when we are making recommendations on which times we should be measuring these variables. And for assessing time-dependent SNPs, we divided this period of the day in four states from 11 p.m. to 6.30 in the morning, 6.30 to 9.30, 9.30 to 6.30 p.m., and 6.30 to 11 p.m. And we observed that there were many genes associated with specific states, 
And these genes are involved in very important metabolic process such, such as neurotransmitter uptake, heart development, and several other traits, fat and digestion absorption. When we go to the second stage, we see, for example, regulation of, uh, of response to stress, lipid homeostasis, and gene regulation. We saw, for example, placenta development, uh, gene regulation, heart development, and many other very important biological process, such as those related to the, the central neural system development, heart development, gene expression, and so on. And what is interesting is that there are genes that influence multiple time periods throughout the day, while there are other genes that are stage specific, okay? And the next question that we had in this area of heat stress is, what are the effects of in neutral heat stress? So my colleague here in West Lafayette, he has done a lot of work from a physiological stress perspective and he has summarized uh, out of his research and others in the literature, what are the impact in the performance of piglets that were heat stressed when they were a fetus? And we see that there are negative impact throughout the whole production cycle, throughout the whole lives of those animals that were in neutral heat stress during the weaning, nursery, grow finish, market, gestation and farrowing and include traits such as greater stress response, altered immune function, reproductive growth, uh, reduced growth performance, reduced feed efficiency, and many other traits. So this is a major issue in the swining industry. And again, from a genetics and genomics perspective, I am interested on understanding what are the consequences of this in neutral heat stress. So why are we observing this change in the, phenotype, in the phenotype of those individuals? And basically we evaluated one of our epigenomic mark that is DNA methylation. There are others that can be analyzed but we have chosen this one that's the most commonly studied in which it is a heritable molecular modification that impact gene expression and the phenotypic outcomes without changing the DNA sequencing. And the most exciting is that recently there has been some studies indicating that in the same way that we can do gene editing on the genome, we can also edit epigenomic marks, which is quite uh, fascinating. And depending on the location of these epigenomic markers, marks such as in the promoters and enhancer regions, it can either upregulate or suppress gene expression and therefore impact phenotypic variability. So the objective of this study then was to compare DNA methylation profiles between control and in neutral heat stress pigs to identify these differentially methylated regions. We had two groups of cells in which one of them were kept in thermoneutral conditions. The other one was heat stressed. We did measurements to verify that they were actually heat stressed. We sampled 20 piglets, 10 that were um, in neutral thermoneutral and 10 in neutral uh, heat stressed. And we performed whole genome by sulfite sequencing we identified multiple regions that were differentially methylated in their promoter regions or in the promoter regions of the genes. And out of the 62 regions that we were identified, 22 were hypomethylated while 40 were hypermethylated. And as I mentioned, increasing uh, DNA methylation within the gene promoter region has been reported to suppress transcription, while hypomethylation of the promoter regions could be associated with upregulation of the gene expression. And in addition to these uh, regions in the, or these differentially methylated regions in the promoter sections of the genes, we also identified other 268 genomic regions that were differentially methylated. They were located across chromosomes and they range from two to 40 regions. And the most significant one was located on chromosome three. 
when we look at what were the genes located on those these regions, it was very interesting. They were related to cellular response to heat stress, placental vascularization, which makes a lot of biological sense, central nervous system, immune response, and several other traits that I did not uh, mention here. So what are the key messages that we get out of these heat stress studies? First, heat tolerance based on routinely measured variables and public weather station is heritable and genetic progress can be achieved through direct genetic and genomic selection. Different environmental gradients and critical periods should be used depending on the trait that's being evaluated and within barn climatic variables are referred. Heat tolerance can be predicted and improved based on genomic information. Physiological indicators of heat tolerance are heritable. Climatic resilience based on automatically measured vaginal temperature seems to be the best indicator, but this is still an ongoing work. And the reasons for that is because it has the highest heritability, is a direct indicator of heat stress at the physiological level, and it can be easily measured in a large number of individuals in commercial forms. And also various genomic regions and candidate genes have been discovered, including time-dependent SNPs and candidate genes. In utero heat stress causes differential methylation patterns and heat tolerance is highly polygenic because there are multiple biological mechanisms involved. And this is still an ongoing project. So there are more results coming soon. Some of these results have been published already and others will be published such as in the World Congress and in publications that we are currently preparing. So now let me move to our second example, which is cattle temperament, which is an area that I really enjoy working on. And we first started evaluating milking temperament in host and cattle, in which animals were evaluated on a five point linear scale with one indicating very nervous and five very calm we had 4,500 animals that had highly reliable phenotypes, which were the regressed breeding values, and close to 6 million genomic markers from whole genome sequence data after the quality control. What we found is that milking temperament is a highly polygenic trait. So there were more than 50 candidate genes identified those candidate genes, they are related to very important biological process, such as pheromone receptor, heart development, oxytocin signaling. And these genes have also been associated with human neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric disorders, cognitive disorders, and aggressive behaviors in several human studies, which was, we were quite intrigued by that indicating that these genes might actually be conserved across mammal species. Then we got a data set, an independent data set from taurine and indesen braids, which are known to have different behavioral characteristics. And we compare the polymorphisms, the difference in allele frequency of polymorphism in those genes that we found. And most of them had significant uh, markers, significant difference between the two groups. And in addition to this work in dairy cattle, we also evaluated uh, beef cattle temperament and docility. And the reason why we were also interested on working on beef cattle is because uh, it was ranked by a national survey that was done by the American Eggs Association docility was ranked within the top three traits of priority to American uh, Angus producers. And reasons for that is because it has detrimental effects on animal welfare and performance, handler safety, meat quality, and longevity of the animals. And working together with American Angus, they have already implemented genomic predictions for docility and they are already making this available to producers. And a very interesting fact that I wanted to draw your attention is this bull that's called the EXT. It's a very famous Angus bull. It is considered the second most influential ancestor of all times in the Angus breed. 
it represents 7.21% of the Angus DNA alive today, with over 66,000 progeny and close to 5 million descendants. Interesting enough, this bull has a negative, a highly negative breeding value for docility. This bull is ranked on the bottom 5% for docility. It, this bull is genotype and has more than 400 daughters with docility measurements. And by talking to Angus producers, they all know that the daughters of this bull, they are usually very aggressive. So it is something that we hear from producers. So we estimated the heritability, developed the methods and estimated the heritabilities for docility. And it has a heritability of 0 0.39, which is a quite high heritability. And again, we found that this is also a highly polygenic trait. And these results have been recently accepted or published in Frontiers in Genetics. And this work has been done by my PhD student, Amanda Alvarenga. And what we found that those genes, again, they were related to a very important process, such as neurological diseases in humans, relearning mechanisms, and knockout mice experiments showed impairment, reduced activity, and increased anxiety-like behavior in individuals that had a knockout for these genes that we also identified in, in Angus, and many others that I will not go into details here. So after these two studies on beef and cattle, we are very intrigued. Are these behavioral genes conserved across mammals? So my student Amanda, so we decided to do a systematic review and we included five species, cattle, including both beef and dairy, sheep, goats, pigs, and humans. And what we did is, so we look for genomic regions that have been published for behavioral traits. We found in the case of beef and dairy cattle, all, all close to 800 genomic regions for 43 behavioral traits, 1400 genomic regions for 65 behavioral traits in pigs, and 155 genomic regions for 24 behavioral traits in sheep and there were no studies for goats. And here is just a cloud map of the different traits that were included in this systematic review. And these studies were done across the whole world. Then we combine all these genes and we uh, studied the genes that had also been annotated in humans. And we were very excited when we found that half of all those genes reported in livestock have been previously associated with behavioral, mental, and neural diseases in humans, including anxiety, autism, depression, uh, attention deficit disorder, antisocial personality disorder, schizophrenia, and many, order, order, many others. And all these genes, they can basically be grouped in biological pathways in three main categories. The first one is the stimuli reception, mainly olfactory, vision, and response to stimuli. The second one, internal recognition to stimuli, such as neuroactive uh, receptors. And the third one, how the individuals respond to that stimuli including blood pressure, fatty acid metabolism, hormone signaling, and inflammatory pathways. And in addition to that, we were interested in evaluating, is there any cognitive ability component to temperament in Angus cattle? To do that, we had data uh, with more than 100,000 cows that have been measured throughout their lives. So every year they had, um, docility measurement. And we have estimated various components. Again, we observed that the heritability was actually quite high, usually above 0 0.4 throughout the, the whole life of the animals and also moderately to highly repeatable. And what was interesting is that we consider, we model these records using random regression and a linear polynomial. And we use the slope of this regression as an indicator of cognitive ability. 
in which a slope greater than one indicates habituation, a slope equal to one, a similar or not much change, and a slope is low, uh, lower than one, a sensitization. And so we can see some animals become more docile over time, and this is at the genetic level, others become more aggressive and others do not change throughout their lives. And remember that I talked to you about the EXT bull before, most of these animals that were top ranked here for the ones that become more aggressive over time, several of those were his progeny. So this again shows the importance and how heritable this trait is. And the favorable cognitive ability may have a positive impact on the long-term animal welfare and the high-tech farming implementation. In other words, those animals that are more docile and the ones that become even more docile over time or that habituate to the handling activities, they would be more desirable. We look at the GWAS for these traits for both the average docility as the intercept and also cognitive ability as the slope. And we found very interesting genes again. And I will highlight just the most, uh, some of them. So these first three genes, they have been reported to be related to anxiety depressive behavior in humans and mice. This other one has been related to spatial learning and memory impairment. And these others, other two genes, they have been related with a high risk of suicide, primarily driven by post-traumatic stress, especially in women, which is very interesting to know. And so what is the next area or what are, the, what are we gonna do in this area of animal behavior? So we are working in dairy cattle and in precision livestock farming, and we have developed what we call the Purdue Animal Science Research Data Ecosystem, in which we are gathering automatically uh, data from precision farms. We are integrating all this data, including video, feeding, genomic, production, activity, and weather data, and many other uh, feeding intake, like milk intake in the calves and all of that. And we are integrating this data so that we can use for deriving novel indicators or novel traits should be included in breeding programs. On the right, we have here a table in which this is only the data from a single farm that we have. We can see that we, in one year, we got over 17 billion data points and we had data for over 261 variables. And this is after quality control. So that means all the ones that had no information have been removed already. So we, this has kept us very busy on trying to understand all this data and how can we use this for breeding purpose. So now going through the third and last uh, example, and I will go faster on this one due to time, it is food allergy in pigs. So this food allergy is a major uh, issue, not only in pigs, but also in humans. It has been estimated that uh, more than 10% of Americans have allergy uh, issues at certain point in their lives. And it, also, it is also a big issue in the case of uh, livestock, especially pigs, especially after weaning, when they are being trans uh, transitioning from milk to, to other diets. And so what my colleague, Dr. Alan Schinkel and others have done is they develop a selection scheme in which the animals were exposed to soybean protein, and then they injected um, soybean protein in the flank regions of those piglets, and they measure the swelling and the redness that uh, as a response to that uh, test in those individuals. And then they select the ones that had the greatest and the lowest response. And they did that for 25 generations. And we can see that after a certain time, they start, we start to see a quite clear difference between the low allergic response line and the high allergic response line, indicating that there is likely a genetic component to allergy response. 
we also use this data to estimate heritability for general soybean allergy response, which is heritable, a heritability of 0.2. There seems to be a weak to a null genetic correlation with a uh, birth weight. So around zero, uh, minus 0 0.25, how, although there was a quite large uh, standard error. And there was a positive genetic correlation between soybean and peanut allergy response with a genetic correlation of 0 0.9, indicating that there is potential cross-reactivity of soybean and peanut allergy in pigs. So as final considerations, animal welfare is a multidimensional concept and therefore multiple and longitudinal variables need to be evaluated. Most welfare indicators are heritable, but they are also highly polygenic and they can be improved through genetic and genomic selection. Welfare assessment, it is still challenging, especially in large scale commercial applications, but there are great opportunities with the use of precision technologies. This is a highly active research area, not only here at Purdue, but throughout the world. And with that, I want to thank my students because they are the ones doing all the work that I'm presenting here today. I also want to thank our funders and our collaborators, especially Dr. Jay Johnson's lab, because he's a heat, uh, stress physiologist and he has not, have contributed a lot to the heat stress work that I presented here today. And I would like to thank you all for the invitation and for your attention. And I will take any questions you might have. Thanks so much. Thank you, Luis. Very, very good talk. I really like your final points that are really interesting. And, you know, if we are going to push agriculture production in future, we need to take into the account welfare more and more in whatever we are doing for sure. Uh, okay, so I have a few questions, but due to time, I think it's better that uh, participants ask. So, uh, in I see in chat we have only one question from from John. What is the dew point, and what does it represent? Yes, Probably so it's connected to big heat stress study. Yes, that's correct. So it is one of the indicators that we evaluated, and dew point it will be basically it is correlated to the temperature, and it will represent basically uh, the environmental conditions take into account the water saturation in the environment. So it is basically correlated with the, the temperature, but it also does take into consideration the humidity in the environment, which is also important when we are evaluating uh, heat stress. Thank you. So we have another question. I think you can see the chat, Luis, but I can read the question. So thanks for presentation. This is a question from Jon Bancic, postdoc in our group. Can you say a bit more on the strategy you use to identify candidate genes once you have identified significant marker trait association in your studies? Yes, that's a, a great question. And it is a point of discussion among researchers. And the reason for that is because after we identify the, the markers, so first there are different ways for us to identify the markers. So for example, if we are using single step uh, GWAS approach, we might use an approximate p-value option. We might use the proportion of the total additive variance that is explained by that specific uh, genomic region. And we might use different ways for doing multiple testing correction. We might do it chromosome-wise, genome-wise. So there are different methods that have been proposed over time and that are being used. So that's one point that we need to, to consider, those methods for identifying the significant markers. After we identify the significant markers, to go to the candidate genes, there are also a wide range of analysis that can be done to come up with those genes. The first one is if we are looking at single SNPs, if we identify single SNPs, we tend to look at, uh, at genes that are not only that completely overlap with that SNP, in other words, SNPs that are within those genes, but also genes that are located close by. 
depending on the linkage disequilibrium in the population that we are analyzing, we might use a window of, let's say, 200 KB on each side of that SNP, might be 100 KB or half megabase pair. So it really depends on how linkage disequilibrium is conserved on that population that we are analyzing. After we have a list of those genes that have been identified, which are considered as positional genes, then we start to look for their function. So we need to use several biological databases that are available. So that is, for example, the CAG key, uh, key GG, there are, for example, NCBI and several other gene ontology terms that will provide information about those genes. We are going to be looking at what are the pathways that are more enriched. In other words, the pathways in which most and uh, more genes that were identified in our list are involved because those are likely uh, key pathways related to the trait that we are analyzing. So we basically have to do a gene prioritization analysis, which will take into consideration the significance of those genes that are those, the list of those genes that we have identified on those, on each one of those metabolic pathways. And so we are going to do a prioritization analysis, gene network analysis, so that we see how those genes are interacting because there might be genes that are important but they might be very, let's say, generalist genes that are involved in a wide range of metabolic process. So we need to basically, after we get to that, uh, that step, the ones that are involved in those pathways that are more significant, significant, we need to look at the literature and see what has already been published for those genes. We look at functional annotation uh, studies where they have, published what are the function of those genes in the species that we are working with. And then we come up with basically the ones that might be the most relevant genes. So it is not a, a single parameter. We try to combine all of that to understand which genes might be the most important ones. And of course, in the publications, we do not list only the ones that we consider as the most important ones, but all the significance level of all the genes that have been identified in a specific study. Thank you, Luis. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it seems so. The young says, perfect, thank you. So yeah, comprehensive answer, I would say. Yeah, so yeah, maybe just your opinion. At one of the pr first slides, you kind of mentioned that uh, we need to kind of figure out and exploit breed differentiation. So. Can you just tell us a few hints? What what were you thinking uh, in in that space? Are you thinking about uh, importance of crossbreeding or breed complementarity in the future, or something else? Yes, that's a combination of both, Ivan. So, for example, let's say that we decide to raise host and cattle in Brazil, in the northern Brazil. It is likely not a good idea, right? So those animals are going to be suffering from heat stress. So their welfare conditions are not gonna be great under those specific uh, environments because they are not adapted. But we know that, for example, if we cross, for example, deer, which is a zebu breed and with hosten, we can generate, which has been proposed as a composite breed in Brazil that's called Giroland, which is a breed that is more adapted. We know that both the Jir and the Jiroland, which are breeds that are more adapted to those specific conditions, they are going to suffer less from heat stress. And of course, heat stress is one of the indicators of uh, animal welfare issues, right? So if we can understand the breeds and how adapted they are to a specific production system, geographical locations, we can choose the genetic resource that will adapt better to those specific conditions. And this is not only for climatic uh, adaptation, but it might also be, let's say, for example, for raising animals in a region that is like very high altitude. So we know that, for example, during speciation, so if we compare Bostaurus 
uh, like cattle and yaks, we know that yak, which like especially in the regions of Tibet and, and China in general, they have been adapted to survive in very high altitudes and cold temperatures. And we can actually evaluate how have they adapted to those conditions, which genes have been fixed and which ones are still segregating. And we actually, my PhD student Pedro, he published recently a study on signatures of selection where we compare, we compare different cattle breeds, but also other closely, closely related boss species to identify genomic regions in which there has been selection signatures, right? Because that will help us understand how those species became more adapted to specific conditions where they are being raised. And the same applies, for example, if we are moving to, let's say, cage-free production system in, in chicken, there might be breeds that will be better adapted to those conditions compared to others. Same if we are raising, let's say, pigs in extensive production system, there are breeds that are more adapted to those conditions as well, right? So what I meant by that point is we can learn from what we have done. So for example, we know that selecting for very high productivity in dairy cattle also increased mastitis, increased metabolic uh, diseases, which are welfare issues, right? So we know that if we want to eliminate those issues, we need to simultaneously select for, for all those traits. So basically what I meant is how can we learn from what we have done in our breeding schemes? How can we learn from what nature has done? So how animals have adapted to different climatic conditions and also in different production systems that we are working with. And it might be developing new composites. It might be evaluating complementary among breeds, exploiting heterosis and so on. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, that's very kind of active research area for our group as well. So yeah, very interesting. So thank you, Luis, we are eight minutes all over. So I see some people are already leaving work. Uh, so any, I'm going to allow time for any final questions from somebody in, in public. So from Sudeta is asking, could you explain a little bit more about polygenic traits in chicken? Uh, yes, I would say that usually most of the traits of interest, not only animal behavior and welfare, are polygenic. So the large majority of traits of interest in livestock, they are polygenic traits. There are a couple exceptions, but most of them are highly polygenic traits. And so this means that if we want to improve these polygenic traits, instead of identifying few markers that will influence this trait, because this is not something that we are going to be able to do if they are highly polygenic traits, what we can do to improve the traits in chicken or any other species is actually by using genomic prediction methods in which we are considering how the markers from, or a good number of markers uh, spread across the whole genome. For example, some of the most common SNP panels used at the moment are 50K or 50,000 genomic markers. And those markers are expected to be in linkage disequilibrium with most of the QTLs or the quantitative trait loci impacting those polygenic traits. And by using a large number of genomic markers, we can make predictions on the genomic uh, merit of chicken or any other species for those traits of interest, especially polygenic traits. Thank you, Liz. Uh... So we have, uh, I'm going to say this is the last question uh, from Bob. Thank you for the presentation. How about the strategy to identify candidate genes of aggressive behavior in pigs? Yes, that's an area that we are very interested. So I would say for identifying candidate genes uh, for aggressive behavior in pigs, first we need to actually be able to collect a phenotype in a large number of individuals in a very accurate way, right? So for example, let's say we are talking about tail biting. 
we need to identify who are the aggressors and not only actually measuring the animals that have had their tails beaten, right? So we need to identify who are the aggressors and also how, how the social interaction among those group housed individuals. This can be very challenging to record it, right? Because we need to either use camera and then we generate a large amount of data and we need to be able to link the individual IDs with the, with the imaging data that we are getting. And that is, this is a very active area of research in Europe, here in the US and other parts of the world as well, trying to actually use computer vision for extracting those phenotypes. I think this is the first step. I, uh, how do we quantify aggressive behavior in pig? So we need to define the phenotype. After we define the phenotypes, then we can do, use methods such as genome-wide association studies to identify genomic markers that are associated with those traits. After we identify those markers, we need to see what are the genes located on those regions. And then on a step that we cannot forget, sometimes us more quantitative geneticists, we tend to forget, but we also need to do a validation of those genes. So after we identify what are the most important genes or the our candidate genes, we also need to do experiments, either gene knockout, gene editing, to try to validate those genes and confirm their function. So I think this would be the, the main point. And I see here that uh, John mentioned that Simon Turner has defined this well. Actually, he gave a seminar. We also have a similar uh, group, a seminar here at Purdue. And a few weeks ago, he gave us a seminar and I have been discussing with him and I plan on collaborating with him on some projects in this area. He has done a lot of very nice work in the area of aggressiveness in pigs and in other species as well. Thank you, Luis. I, I think that everybody was quite excited. So I would suggest if anybody had any additional questions, uh, you can find Luis's uh, email and uh, you can easily send him an email. Yeah. Thank you one more time and yeah, see you soon. Yes. Thanks so much, Yvonne. And as you said, like if anyone is interested either in collaborations or if you have any questions, please feel free to, to reach out to me.